What is up you guys? Welcome back to my channel. I'm so excited for today's video because I watched Harry Potter and the Sorcerer slash Philosopher's Stone in 0.25 speed and I'm here to tell you what I discovered. So the first nod we get at the color palette that is to be is when the students come out of the reptile house in Slytherin Green, Slytherin Reptile House. Little on the nose, but we get it. And they don't look too evil, so I'm glad that J.K. Rowling is actually representing some nice Slytherins for once. Though honestly, they kind of look like the girls who like draw your face on a pig and write it in the stall of the bathroom. So maybe they're not so nice. If you read the books, you know that they end up sending Harry to a private school where they need uniforms, but of course they're not going to spend an iota of money on the child. So they dye some of Dudley's old uniforms gray and it's described as looking like elephant skin. Not to mention, who knows what Dudley did in those? Like, can you imagine the farts? They're probably next level. We end up seeing it in the movie, but it's a really quick moment and if you haven't read the books, you probably wouldn't even know what she's doing. When Harry, the obviously not Ravenclaw, does get his letters and jumps on top of the table to get them instead of sneakily grabbing one from the floor, a bunch of them come from the fireplace. This is actually a nod to The Birds by Alfred Hitchcock. <sighs> and Uncle Dursley's like, that's just not gonna fly. I'm sorry. Eventually our boy is saved by his furry giant friend Hagrid. He is furry, he's not a furry, although we don't know, we're not judging. But their first adventure is to get Harry his school supplies and they stop by the leaky cauldron. Now, what you might not have noticed is the sign itself is actually plain and black and has no writing on it until they get a little closer and then leaky cauldron becomes displayed. Now we see this a lot with wizarding things like Hogwarts itself is actually just seen as ruins to muggles unless you're magical then it displays itself for you. So we can see that the leaky cauldron itself is locked down magic kind of secrets and whatnot keep it from being seen by muggles. This next one I'm very excited about because it has to do with my boy Snape over here and it has to do with his first lesson with Harry. In it, he asks Harry what he would get if he added powdered asphodel to an infusion of wormwood. Harry, of course, doesn't know, but if we break down the question, it actually reveals a secret message. Asphodel is actually another word for a lily and in the Victorian era, they actually had a flower code for different, um, you know, bundles of flowers that people would give or write in poetry or draw. Those all had a meaning and for lily, it means demise. Now wormwood actually means loss or absence. So when you put it together, it means I bitterly regret Lily's death. Shout out to him in the first one. Boom. I wanted to your mom, but I didn't, but I wanted to. So I'm mad at you because you're the product of the guy who did get to her. Now, obviously McGonagall's very excited that Harry becomes a Quidditch player. She really, really wants to beat the Slytherin team. You know that Snape and her had running bets and gags going about who was gonna win the Quidditch Cup that year. And we also see another reason why she would have been really excited. In the case where we see the trophies and Quidditch memorabilia, we see James Potter, obviously, but next to it in 1971, we see McGonagall also won a prize for being a Quidditch player. And it doesn't end there. The trophy actually has another secret, which is Tom Riddle's award for service to the school. <coughs> Gross. Now, aside from Harry saving Neville's Rememberal during their whole flying lesson kerfuffle, we also see what makes him an amazing seeker in his first lesson with Oliver Wood. Now, Oliver's gone through all the rules and stuff for Quidditch and then brings out the golden stitch. He releases it and automatically looks to the right and loses it as soon as he lets go of it. But Harry kept his eye on it the entire time, which shows us that he really was born to be a seeker. And Oliver hopes they win. <laughs> Knock on wood. I'm so sorry. Can't stop, won't stop. As we see him in his first Quidditch game, there's actually a celebrity face in the crowd. Julianne Huff, who you might know from Dancing with the Stars and Footloose, Grease, a bunch of other things. She was actually one of the students in the crowd. Now this one's more of just a cute little fashion moment. You'll notice the way that they wear their scarves is actually very indicative of their personality. Hermione wears hers neatly tucked in, very orderly for actual warmth. Ron kind of just puts it on, like it's barely touching his body. He's kind of just doing it to be like, okay, I put it on so I can't get yelled at for not wearing my uniform, basically not even trying. And then you have Harry who's kind of doing it for fashion, but also kind of doing the bare minimum, you know? It reminds me of how they all were assigned essays about their characters and Hermione wrote, Emma wrote pages and pages about hers. Harry wrote like one and Ron didn't even turn it in because he said that, well, Ron wouldn't do it. And by Ron, I mean Rupert. See, they already blend together in my mind. 
Now this one is crazy. I can't believe I never noticed this before. When Harry is in the Great Hall, his scar starts to burn and it seems kind of random if you don't really know why his scar is activated or the whole story with Voldemort. But if you look at the head table when it goes into Snape's power model pose where he's looking like this at Harry, we're all like, oh my gosh, it's Snape. He's the evil one. That's why Harry's scar is burning. But actually Quirrell's head is turned around. He's facing away from him, which means Voldemort's face was actually facing Harry and that is why his scar was burning. See what I did there? You can't see Voldemort because your turban was covering your eyes. Poor little Harry Bean is wandering the castle as usual, you know, just going places where he's not supposed to be when he comes around the mirror of Erised. Now he's trying to figure out what it means and all that jazz. Eventually Dumbledore tells him, hey, it shows you what you most want. But Harry could have actually figured this out on his own if he thought to look at the words backwards, which I never even thought about this until I was reading, reading more and more fan theories. So I kept my eye out for it while I was watching. And it's true. If you look at the inscription above the mirror, it reads, I show not your face, but your heart's desire. I think it would be a really interesting show or even like a TikTok or YouTube series for someone to show us what all of the characters see in the mirror ever said. We mentioned Neville's Remember a little bit earlier, but one of the cute things about it is that he's in the Great Hall and he's looking and he's like, I can't remember what I've forgotten. And the thing he forgot was his robes. The directors actually kind of zoom out so you can see the students behind him and him sitting at the table so we get that juxtaposition. And if you see, he's just in his little like sweater being all cute and precious and everyone else has their formal like black robes on. That's what he forgot. Now, I am a huge history nerd. I'm obsessed with the monarchy and the lineage of the royals and all that jazz. So this one was very exciting. I heard a rumor that there was an Anne Boleyn poster somewhere in the Hogwarts uh, background during one of the staircase scenes. So I was trying to find it and I finally did. It's a picture of Anne Boleyn. And if you don't know Anne Boleyn, she was done to death by slanderous lies or more simply, witchcraft was her main accusation along with some other things that are a little too pg-13 for this video but she was put to death because of witchcraft and you can actually see her in a portrait in hogwarts now i don't know about you but if i was there i definitely would want to talk to her portrait I'd be like i know he was cute and all that but like was he worth it probably not though she did get out of there before his leg got all like super stanky if you don't know what i'm talking about google it now we're going to talk about chess if you've seen the first film or read the books, you know that chess plays a major part in this film slash book. I used to hate on Ron for being kind of dumb, but then someone pointed out that he's actually really good at chess and chess takes a high level of intellect and strategy. In the game, we see Ron capture one of Harry's knights. Now this is a big deal because it ends up being the similar move in the final chess game, you know, for their lives when they're trying to get to the Sorcerer's Stone. We actually see the queen kill the knight just like in the big dramatic move at the end and Ron boy has got to go zip zap plop, you know what I mean? And if you look around, there's actually discarded pieces around the chessboard showing us that Voldemort's already been through there. Or Quirrell, however you want to slice it, dice it. In the past, I thought that it was just like, you know, ruins or dust around the chessboard because I'm like, well, you know, probably no one's down there so it's gotten a little musty dusty. No, it's from Quirrell. And lastly, I love little after credit scenes or credit eggs. In the second movie, we see Lockhart going insane on a book. Uh, in the Prisoner of Azkaban one, you can see lots of little things with the footprints. It's really interesting. In this one, the credit for the man who played Voldemort's voice is actually credited under he who must not be named. So there you guys go. Those are some fun Easter eggs from the first movie. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, be sure to subscribe because I put out new videos every single week and it helps me a whole bunch. Subscribe.